Hello and a very warm welcome here at the Zum Tove Industry Trialog. I'm welcoming you here from this beautiful light forum in Dornbirn, Austria. My name is Anja Lange. I'm a moderator from Germany and I'm very delighted to be guiding you through this virtual event here today. So today we will be talking about digitalization and logistics. This is actually um, supposed to be quite advanced. So today we want to have a look at how far are the implementations in reality. For this, we have invited experts from renowned companies and they will share their experience. We will really benefit from their experience here today. They will share their input in short presentations about the future of logistics, about topics like like um, positioning, sustainability, last mile management, and much more. And after those inputs, we will get together with all speakers again, and we will discuss the future of logistics in a panel discussion. And that's exactly where we need your input as well. So we want to have this session really interactive. So please use the opportunity, ask questions to our speakers, and please use for this the chat here on the right hand side of your screen. After this, the experts will actually be available for further discussion in the different breakout rooms. I know that Zum Tobel would have loved to invite you here to this light forum, to Austria. It's actually snowing outside. It would have been so beautiful. But as you know, uh, for given reasons, that's not possible at the moment. However, Zum Tobel really wanted to create this experience like you're actually here with us in the light forum. So that's why they've created this platform specifically for this event. And I know, uh, I'm sure you have already discovered some of the features, but let me just give you a bit more of advice. So you should have already picked your avatar. Mine actually looks better than reality, but <laughs> that's a different topic. And when you then with your avatar in the same room with like other participants, you can interact with them. So you can chat, you can exchange business cards, or you can actually arrange a meeting even in the future because the platform is going to be open another week after this event. This is also the reason why you can rewatch all the sessions for another week. As you can see here on the slide, this is the lobby, the central hub, where you, where you can explore many different things. For example, on the left-hand side, there is the fair. This is our virtual exhibitor booth. And so please have a look at the booths, uh, watch the videos, explore the brochures, and uh, yeah, really interact with our partners there. All right, so now we are about to start our presentations. Uh, please keep for this your cameras off and your microphones muted. As I said, if you would like to interact with our speakers, please post your questions into the chat. For the opening words here of the Zum Tobel Industry Trialog, I'm pleased to welcome Alfred Felder, Chairman of the Board and the CEO of Zum Tobel Group. Welcome. Thank you very much, Anja. Also, warm welcome from my end. Unfortunately, obviously, we can do it only digital, but welcome to our industry trialog. We are looking forward really to an expert panel today, and I'm pleased uh, about your interest and participation here now, unfortunately, via digital means. What awaits us? Um, an exchange between industry specialists the topic is all about logistics and about uh, how digitization can succeed in this field. Especially during the last months, we have seen how important the management area of logistics is for the companies due to the challenges posed by the global pandemic. Mostly all of us are experiencing a lack of key components, raw materials and rising prices, which can in the worst case, halt the entire production of a company. And in this respect, I'm very much looking forward to the impulses and the insights on trends, possible solutions and topics of the future, which we can all benefit from. And I'm also very pleased that we, as a Zoom Tobel Group, can share some of our own ideas. With his keynote, Ralph Müller, who is our senior consultant of digital services at the Zoom Tobel Group, he will talk about how the lighting infrastructure can drive digitization. And in this regard, the focus is on remote monitoring and location-based services 
as integrated components of a lighting solution. And with this in mind, we are looking forward to the keynotes from the different perspectives on how smart logistics can have an impact on our everyday business and especially in times we are facing today. So thank you very much again for participation. Thank you. I would like to say thank you very much, uh, Mr. Felder, for these opening words. So yes, this is exactly what we are going to talk about. And also we're going to talk about data, yeah? data and information, because that is the foundation of digitalization and of those digital services that Mr. Felder just talked about. And what digitalization looks like at the Zumtobel plant in Dornbirn, that's what we're going to find out now by Martin Winter. He is the Vice President Operations of the plant Dornbirn at Zumtobel Lighting. And he has actually many years of experience in digitalization of production and logistics. So I'm very pleased to be welcoming him. Hello, Martin Winter. Hello, yeah. Nice to be here. <laughs> How are you today? I'm absolutely fine. That's and good. I'm glad that I have the opportunity again to speak at the Zumtobel Industry Trilogs to so many people. And especially I'm glad that I have the ability today to talk about logistics and digitalization. I can imagine. And both, I both are very exciting but topics. Are they? Yes, <laughs> of course. That's why we're talking about them. Well, I leave you to it, to your presentation. And after that, I will be asking some questions. <laughs> Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. So welcome from me as well. Um, I would like to take you a little bit to our very exciting logistics journey. So give you some insight view on what we are doing at Zumtobel right now. And that's why I've called it the logistics journey. A journey somehow starts, our journey has already started. And many journeys in our lives end. Logistics journeys never end. So I give you a little bit of overview right now. So we'll talk about where do we come from with our logistics journey? What do we want to achieve? And what do we need to do right now? And finally, um, I'd like to tell you where are we now on this journey? And uh, we'll discuss with Anya some of the lessons learned that we have already uh, taken from that. What you see right now is a screenshot of our current Zoomtobel light system. This is the system how we manage the plant. It looks not very appealing, and it isn't. For the people who use it, of course, it's easy. They know exactly the number code they need to punch in, and they get some information about material that is somehow in the plant, and they can order the material for existing jobs to be done, and it's just about administration of material. That's not even more. And we like to take more in the future of an uh, electronic supported system. This is a picture of, um, of production. This is where we assemble light fields. This is one of our innovative products. You do not see much innovation because it's covered by cardboard, it's covered by, by material that is stored, that is needed for the next job, but we can do better. And for doing that, we are achieving um, new things. And we use software, of course, software-based, Today we work with SAP and we extend the usage of SAP in the plant heavily over the next months. We are implementing SAP Extended Warehouse Management and SAP ME for manufacturing execution. Both are huge packages that we have um, difficulties, to difficulties to digest that and that's why we have taken an external consultant to help us. ConCircle is the name of that external consultant that gives us insight on how we do that best possibly and how we implement it within the given budget and within the given time frame. So that is the goal to go with an SAP Analytics Cloud as the coverage of everything where we collect all data, where we can drive analysis and make um, a plan for future actions from there. We want to have a detailed scheduling, what you see in the upper right corner of that slide, that we use Conos, that is a software that is provided by this, by this uh, company, ConCircle, and it helps us to improve our on-time delivery rate. It's a much better planning tool that we have today, and it helps us also um, to supply the material that is needed, so available to promise, and it considers even missing parts that we can compensate this by a change of the planning. 
exception in material handlings are taken care of and we do a finite capacity planning. This is essential, especially since we have a, a staged process that goes from pre-manufacturing, handling with steel, finally forming the steel, stamping, welding. Uh, we do powder coating and finally it ends up somewhere in assembly. And all this needs to be considered as the whole picture and it needs to be planned like the whole process is everywhere. And this is possible with our new software solution. Then we have material um, handling. We have mobile applications in the future. That is essential that people on the forklift truck can, can apply to material. People at the machine can scan in with what machine they are and can get machine conditions from there and they can get the order numbers and everything they need to do their job without moving back to a terminal somewhere in the office. In the end, we want to achieve a better traceability, what you see on the left side. Today, we, we would barely speak of traceability. Every individual luminaire in the future will have its own individual number. From there on, we can derive who has produced it, when, using what components of what batch number. This is something we need, especially in case of warranties. Fortunately, we do not have many cases of this. And it needs, of course, to help to, to phase in new products, to phase in and phase out improvements. And this is all for better control of how we do it and, and keep record of that. Operator guidance will be coming to the next level. People will have screens next to their workshops to know exactly what they need to do with instructions. And they will all increase the, contr the control of uh, everything we do and to keep up the quality. In the end, the logistics will change. We will not have many places where we store material around where people work. We will drive the material automatically to the work centers based on the orders they are handling at this moment. And the picture to the lower left, you see a picture that is taken in Spennymoor. That is our, one of our lighting um, plants in the UK, where we already use automatic, uh, automatic guided vehicles to, to a large success. And we want to drive that to the next level, where the vehicles have some intelligence by themselves, know how to drive from A to B, just based on an order they get from the system. And today, the AGVs we use in Spanimo just have a fixed route. And this is lacking from flexibility where I dream of we should have in a plant of a certain size. This is all very cool and it will all be a bright future, but it's a hard way to go. First of all, it's most important that we create an optimal analog world. It's so painful to digitize um, a process that is not perfect and then you have finally a digital process, but it's just reflecting an imperfect world. And we're trying to create the best analog system before we're going to digitalization, because it means to avoid creating a digital copy of an, ex of an expensive process. So we first of all started to analyze the value streams in the plant. We streamlined the main value streams as good as possible. There are always things you can't move, you can't put somewhere else like a powder coating center. And then finally, we are in the process of adapting the plant layout, layout accordingly. Just to give you an example, this is a material flow chart. You won't see much in this picture anyway, but the many numbers and lines reflect the way the material flows just for one product, the light fields three. So material is traveling through the, through the plant for different reasons. There are injection molding stations, there is powder coating, which I've already mentioned. There is an assembly process, there's packaging, and it's a long, long trip of the material. And that is a reason why it takes too long to make such a luminaire. We did value stream analysis for all the products we have in the plant. This is just an example again for light fields. You see where value is created. You can visu visualize where value has been just not created, but things happening like a transport from A to B, like a buffer, like unnecessary things that we need to avoid. So bringing that clearly on the table helps us to organize it much better than it was in the past. And then we need to select the optimal material supply concept for each material, for each use case. Uh, simple materials that, that has been used every day for almost every luminaire you can supply and Kanban system, that is the cheapest way to bring material to the line. It does not require a second pick up and drop. It does not require to pre-count it. So we do that for all the simple materials that are in use every time, like wires, caps, or even steel coils are supplied by Kanban to the, to the presses. 
and cannot be, or should not be ordered by, by order. So then we implement a supermarket concept in Dornbirn. The commissioning of these materials will take place some hours before we need it, so we are sure we have everything together and it's of the good quality. And then we implement quick access areas. For the large items we need for assembling, like houses, housings or luminary frames or glasses which easily break or have easily quality problems. And then we defined we need to schedule, we're already in the process, uh, to implement scheduled milk runs which supply things on the hour exactly to the time when it's needed for assembly. But this needs all much more control and electronically supported control than we have today. We have had um, a cooperation with an external supplier, EPOL, of Germany, who, who did a lot of, of analysis how much time we spend for certain logistics processes in the plant. They did an analysis for weeks on the shop floor, counting numbers, counting times, seeing how many times the, the logistics operators are moving from A to B. And then they created simulations for us to say, if we change the logistics processes to another way, how many hours we can save. And this was essential for our decision to go for those different tracks of Kanban, supermarket and pre-commissioning area to see that as an optimum for the analog world. In the end, what we did is we checked our warehouse sizes, where should warehouses be in the plant and what size should you have. And while looking through the warehouses, we identified that we have too many products which are, which are simply there. They are not moved to the extent we should have it in, an, in a warehouse. So we eliminated many of the surplus of materials. We decided to go for less buffer stocks for any safety processes. So safety stocks have gone down to the, to the risk, um, risk adopted level we should have it. And that helped us increase to, to reduce space requirements and make space more living in the plant. And then while we do that in parallel, we started to create our the digital factory. We developed and implemented best practice logistics processes. That's why we had ConCircle in-house who have implemented SAP EWM and SAP ME and many other companies before and could help us indicating this could be a better process. This could be the best process that they have seen anywhere else. And we said goodbye to many processes we have had in use for 20 years in Sumtobel and said no. We should not digitalize a copy of our today's poor world. We should go for the ideal world as good as we can. So we are now in the change process by creating better logistics processes and implement a new planning system, which I've already mentioned. And we also implement the warehouse management. This all comes together. It all needs to do with basic data. So right now my team is overworking all basic data that we have for materials, for routings and everything to have it up properly when we start going live. And then the next thing is my dream to implement automatic internal transportation. So we like to f deliver the finished good to our, uh, to our distribution center by AGVs and then also deliver materials from the warehouse to the assembly lines. Our project Alpha is an, a, new, a new product that comes into the market um, in almost uh, two years. And there we have a reference concept being set up right now for doing this highly automated with all materials being run and supplied to the assembly line automatically. So this well helps us to discover the future. This is a screenshot of Konos, which allowed detailed scheduling. Indeed, this is now live since two weeks and we are now experimenting with it in parallel to the existing system to see how reliable it is. But it's working and we are just spending hours of time for every individual working with it to get trained. The training must be documented well enough to share it with everybody else in the plant who require and have access to Konos. Then we will provide automatic jobs for the material supply to the plants, to the lines everywhere. And finally, in the end, we can execute production based on a system that tells us step by step what product needs to be made on lines in what order to match the whole process network that we have all over in the plant. And this visibility and transparency will help us to do the right things and will enable us to react quickly when there are disturbances like machine failures, like materials missing, something that is not the rarely as, as some sometimes thought, materials missing is um, 
uh, almost daily uh, occurrence right now. And it will help us to overcome that easier than with our manual tools today. Where are we now? As already mentioned, we are creating the optimal analog logistic processes already in parallel. And we are in the process now of adapting the plant layout. So we move production lines, we move people's jobs from A to B. Further on, we select the, uh, the optimal material supply and we do that already. And we are implementing right now the milk run supply to the lines. This is not only done in Dornbin, we do this in parallel in our production plants in Niche. We have already done this in Spennymore in the UK. So this is ongoing for several areas within some total lighting. Lighting is a subject. I see lighting is changing where I am, but it's, it's cooler now. And in parallel, we're creating the digital factory. As I said, best practice logic processes are already in process. I think it's almost done. Konos is already live. And now SAP EWM and uh, SAP ME are coming live on February next year. We are in the last stages of doing that. And uh, it appears to be very promising. The, the most important thing is that we need to communicate changes. As I said, we will not copy today's world. We will create a new world in logistics. That means we need to tell people what we are doing, why we are doing it, where is the improvement for everybody, what is the change, what does it mean? And this is, is really critical right now as people seem to come to work on Monday and do not find their workplace anymore if we don't communicate that properly. But we have to do that and it's my personal job and my team's job to tell that to people every day. Changes in thinking and changes in working proactively needs to be communicated and presented to the people. I think this is the most essential to take people with it with on our journey. It's our journey, not mine. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for those very interesting insights into your digital factory. Um, so you've already mentioned that we want to talk a bit about the lessons learned. You've mentioned in the beginning that um, obviously digitalization is a journey and I think you have already come quite far on that journey, but it never ends. Um, so what are the lessons learned until now in terms of processes, in terms of the production? From now, Already we know that it was a good decision and I would always do that again to bring in a cross-functional team. Mm -hmm. So just being people working in logistics and our logistics experts, which I'm not, they can't create the real world. You need to have the customers of logistics on board as well. Mm -hmm. That means production people must be involved. People of the engineering department who need to design new things. People of IT are very important. Yeah. IT is giving us a broad guidance and recommendation which IT tool is the right one, which tools can we later on use. And we need to have the right external partners who bring in new insights that we would not have developed on ourselves. No. Sometimes you are blind on things and others come and say, you can do it that way. It is even easier than you've done it 30 years ago. That's so, what I want to say because you always, uh, well, we've always done it that way, but then you yeah. need an external side. Okay, you mentioned also that you had to move people's jobs or that you have to tell people, okay, from now on you're doing something else. I guess that is quite difficult for, for um, the workforce for the people. How did you manage that and what did you learn from that? We managed that by being honest. Mm -hmm. You can always tell nice things and they will never happen. You have to be honest and say, we want to do that. That is the goal. We need to go there. And when people understand the goal, and this is the most essential thing, mm -hmm. they start to move that direction. Some need some little bit more push than others. Creating the excitement about the change is essential. I think we, we caught about 50% by creating excitement and the other 50% of the people we need to continuously push a little bit. We are in the fortunate situation right now that we are lacking from materials. Yeah. In this position, it's a fortunate situation because we are forced to do changes every day and to be flexible. And we have managed to, to give about 30% of the crew right now a different job within the last month. Oh, wow. Move from that assembly line to another, move from doing welding jobs to assembly moves. So people change already and see it's good to their benefit to have a broader experience. They are more valuable to the company and that logistics comes on top. And I think the flexibility is given in the right now. And I see that the management's behind that. They are supporting that from top. I have my colleagues who support me and I see that even the Works Council is supporting that. So it's one team and it's an international team as this is only the first step is in Dornbirn. 
we create the template for all the other international sites of lighting in Zumtobel, and they are involved in the project. The colleagues from Niche, from Svenimo, from Lemgo, mm. they are all in, in this project, give their inside view, tell them, tell us where are their legacy systems? What do they need to keep for a certain reason? That we simply do not roll over everything and say, this is the way. So that dialogue is essential. So really take them with you and be honest. Not always easy. <laughs> I can imagine, I can imagine. Well, unfortunately, that's the way. It's, it's, it's not an easy journey, but I think it's worth it. And um, I assume you also have a personal goal that you would like to get out of this journey. Like, let's say two years from now on, where would you like to be in which stage of your journey? In two years from now, the goal is to deliver every customer the product they want at that time. They deserve it and they want it. And then we would have done everything right regarding logistics and planning. I guess this is the right and correct answer, <laughs> thinking about the customer view, uh, customer's view. Well, Martin, this has been really lovely. Thank you so much uh, for introducing uh, the plant in Dornburn to us and everything that's new. So have a great rest of the event and thank you. Thank you. Enjoy the rest. Thank you. Bye-bye. We will now start with the short impulses of the speakers. Again, let me remind you to please ask questions here to our speakers. And we will start with a presentation from Volvo Group in Belgium, in which we will receive some insights into the logistics of their production. I'm delighted to introduce to you Rudy van Leeuwen. He is project manager for electrical installations at Volvo Group Trucks. And he will tell us more about the central distribution center, the assembly of the Volvo trucks, and how they have used lighting to enhance the production. I'm excited to hear about this more. So uh, welcome, Rudy. Hello to everyone. Welcome from Belgium. You may start with your presentation if you like. <laughs> Hello to everybody from uh, Belgium. Hello. Um, Rudy, yeah, you may start with your presentation if you like. Is everything working all right for you? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I'm presenting, but it seems nobody hear me, hears me. No, we can hear you actually fine. Can everybody see my presentation? Yes, we can see the presentation and we can hear you. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. This was not a, a good start, but okay. Again, uh, All good. thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I'm Rudy van Leeuwen uh, from um, real estate department at Volvo Ghent. I'm responsible for the high medium uh, voltage installations at Volvo and also for the light infrastructure. So um, when I received the invitation of BIT, uh, I was thinking um, how uh, I can uh, provide some information, additional information for the double, uh, what is um, currently um, the questions I receive from the management. So. Uh, um, as presentation, I started, of course, a welcome uh, at the Volvo Group. Uh, as you see, we have uh, different departments in uh, different branches, from trucks to buses to um, motorboats and uh, Volvo constructions in Germany. Uh, we have about uh, 100,000 employees uh, divided in 80 countries and we serve 180 markets. Um, the Belgium side uh, is um, mainly divided in two big parts is the Volvo truck assembly and the central distribution center, which has an area in total of one square uh, kilometer. We uh, are very proud to be the first CO2 industrial company um, in Europe, um, which we uh, allow us to um, have a CO2 industrial company with uh, three wind turbines and also a very big uh, area of solar panels. 
our central distribution center has about 8.5 million order lines per year um, with uh, 75 incoming transports and 65 outgoing transports. So the distribution center is a very important center in our uh, site in Ghent. The service margin logistics had about 800 employees, uh, is about 130,000 square meters. Also, we have a department of uptime services, uh, which means that um, if somebody has a problem with his truck, he can call our uh, uptime service uh, center, and we have about 2.5 million uh, calls per year. The Volvo truck assembly area, uh, we produce about 40,000 uh, trucks a year, um, which means that we in 2018 had already the first million truck built in Ghent. Those are the different trucks we produce in Ghent. The FH16, the FH, the FM and the FMX. Of course, um, with building this truck, we build it in the truck air assembly area where light, of course, is very impo important. We build our trucks with passion. It means that we are there for our customers, for ourselves, of course, and colleagues, and for our work facility. To perform our job, we continues learn, we continues to improve, and we try to standard, make a standardization as much as possible in work, but also in KPIs. When I joined Volvo in 2017, we started with uh, leading of our uh, normal lights, let's say, into different light projects, which means that um, Light is a very important energy consum consumer in our plant, which means that we have in the truck assembly, 29% of our uh, energy consumption is light. In the warehouse is 41% is uh, energy consumption, which means that light is a very big issue at our plant in Ghent. In Ghent, we have also our energy policy agreement, which means that we continue to improve our uh, electricity consumption, which means that it reflects on our light, of course. So for the EBO, um, we have the obligation to implement cost-effective saving measures, but also there is an annual verification of the process. And we have regular energy audits where we have to prove what we are doing to save energy. Since 2015, we have a total energy saving by 7.9% and the share of the relighting is 5.2%, which is a lot. And 66% of the energy savings results are due to LED relighting projects and integration of SWART controls. When we, when we approach light projects, we make always a group to have the best result. It means Volvo as management ask for relighting projects and to save energy. Volvo real estate perform um, and make the project in reality with a light as Zimtobel, of course, supplier. Our contractors, Flanders, which is a part of Belgium, is also pushing us to save energy and also Elia. Elia is our uh, energy provider who also push to reduce our energy consumption. Project, what projects we already have done in the coming, in the past years? We did some landscapes. Uh, we also worked a lot of projects in our warehouse where we change from normal fluorescent lighting to uh, LED lighting. We implement daylight control by uh, when we refurbished the roof, we also implement uh, 
uh, light catchers so we can have a daylight control. Also on the first and second floors, we installed new uh, LED lighting with uh, half hour Ensign Tobel. Our total warehouse um, is about 200 meters on 450 meters and 12 meter height. And in this overview, you see um, what we did in the past and in this year. This year we did already, uh, I think, 15,000 square meters of new relighting projects, all with Simtobel. We installed so far and from 2017 until now about five kilometers of Tecton uh, rail. We invest the last uh, four years about 2 million euro on new relighting projects. It means it's a very important uh, part of our uh, energy uh, reduction. What is our journey in relighting projects? Where we are coming from and where we want to go? In this overview, you will see our stairway. We are coming from fluorescent lightning and starting in 2017 with LED lightning lighting and hardware sensors. Every step we want to improve uh, what we can do with light. So in 2018, we introduced DALI and daylight control. In 2019, we connected all our DALI routers in one network so that we can share information on all uh, uh, routers who are controlling the light. So the hardest thing was to convince IT to make to create a separate network for all our DALI routers. So in 2020, we started to connect one by one when we have a new lighting, pro lightning project, the routers we implemented in this network. This year, we started to speak with IT to connect our network of routers to our Honeywell building management system to share information between those two separate networks. This is not an easy uh, exercise because IT has always his uh, safety questions, uh, protection questions. So those steps uh, are coming one by one, but will be solved in, I hope in 2000, 2021, beginning 2022. The questions I get from the management is, what can you provide us the energy? How much we consume exactly in which warehouse? So in 2022, we will start to read out from all drivers the energy and collect them and send them to the, our um, uh, building management system to have an overview in which department, how much they consume and what we can do with it. Maybe we can make some other actions to, the re to reduce the energy. In 2023, my dream is uh, to collect all data coming from um, the, the DALI drivers and um, send this energy to logistic, um, to logistic software. Maybe they can use it to improve their actions. So in, in a nutshell, what are the questions from the management uh, from Volvo is, what is the total energy savings so far in kilowatts due to all our relighting project investments? As you see the last four years when we um, invest uh, 2 million euro and relighting projects, but what is the total energy so far? At this point, we can only do it with predictions. So coming hours, uh, euro per kilowatt, but what is the, the, re the real number? So with this information from the drivers, I can, I can um, easily uh, give it to the management. So we have to also to, of course, we need an energy manager who can follow up 
And this is, will be also the future at real estate that you have a, an energy manager who will follow not only electricity, but also HVAC uh, insulation, etc. So, of course, the cost control is asking, uh, Rudy, can you predict for the coming months what will be our energy consumption in euro? So we can save, preserve this money to pay our uh, bill, of course. And do you have a small program who can handle it? Because we are not, uh, we will not do in clicking and kind of program. So we need uh, a smart program that can predict for us what will be the coming uh, kilowatt uh, consumption next month. This will be very interesting for us. And what further investments need to be done to perform above. So we are looking for programs that can easily help us to make some predictions in energy consumption. But of course, um, the first thing they ask now is what is the additional value of our investments in DALI control? This is a daily question. I answer with it will come, it will come. It means once we can read out all data from the driver, we can predict uh, running hours, we can predict uh, lifetime, we can predict uh, energy consumption, etc. And the next question they asked to me was, can light armature contribute to reduce our general costs? So that was my next episode. I was in panic because what will be next? But of course, we have to think about it. We can control armatures by switching on off, dimming and control by a building management system or another system. But what we can do with the output? If we have an embedded sensor in our armatures in every corridor of our warehouse, we see the pulses. And what we can do with these pulses? We can use these pulses to help um, logistics movements. We can say every pulse or every two pulses is one movement in one corridor. It means if you have a number of 500, it means in that corridor we had 250 movements. And maybe the first line in our warehouse has 250 movements per day, and another one has 500. Maybe this data is interesting for logistic movements and we can use it to place goods in another corridor. So it's more effective. If we read all the, the data from our driver, they can give me some valuable information that we use for energy consumption, as I said in the previous slides. But also maybe we can add some embedded temperature measurements that can we that we can use for the HVAC control. In a warehouse, maybe some goods need lower temperature than others. Maybe it's not necessary to heat the warehouse up to uh, 20 or 18 degrees, maybe 15 degrees is enough. So we can measure it because we and if each armature has a temperature sensor, we can easily follow the temperature and maybe we can use it as value information to the BMS system. So all these data need, of course, to be sent to the cloud or we need connections with our BMS and cloud to uh, to handle with this information and to use it as a workflow information. So if embedded amateurs gives an impulse when a work lift enters a corridor, so we can use really this information as added value to, uh, to logistics. So data coming from the driver and PTC components, thermocouple components, um, my point of view are worthful information to use in the future to help not only logistic but also by myself to analyze uh, in a smart way the data coming from each armature. Thank you for this short introduction in Volvo. I had only 10 minutes so I was very fast and very sorry for that and thanks to everybody. 
All good. We would like to say thank you to you, uh, Rudy, for this presentation. And I think it was very uh, interesting to see like those questions you've integrated that management is asking you. And this is a topic I would like to discuss a bit further later in our panel discussion. So thanks for now and I'll see you later then. Thank you very much. Well, I've said we are going to be talking about a lot of uh, big topics in logistics today. And another one is positioning. So where are my products? Where are my materials, my assets? And this is what we want to discuss now in the next presentation. So how tracking creates transparency for logistic processes and how location aware software and solutions can help you in industry 4.0. We will find out from an expert for this Indotrax. They are actually a partner of Zum Tobel as well. And I would like to say a very warm welcome to Peter Portner. He is the sales manager at Indotrax and he has actually more than 25 years of experience in sales and sales management. Hello, Peter. How are you today? Hello, Anja. Thank you very much. I am fine. I hope you too. Here it's raining, unfortunately, not snowing. Oh, no. It's very heavy snowing here. So. <laughs> And I love to be there, but hopefully next time. Exactly. Well, have fun at your presentation. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. My name is Peter Portner. Uh, I'm in charge of sales within Indotrex, and I like to explain in a few slides about uh, our company. Oh, sorry for that. Okay, um, a few words to our patient. We strongly believe that location will be a significant improvement for all manufacturing and logistics company. This is the reason why our offering combines cross-border technology, which we embedded into our software in order to give to the customer the right location information at the right time. So we as a company, we focusing on, on, um, on, on mid-size uh, company called Germany Mittelstand as well aerospace and automotive. So our overall organization, we have more, um, most of the, our, our team members have more than 15 years knowledge in the real-time location environment. So what we're doing, we are serving our customer with ex uh, expertise and special consultancies in order to identify dedicated use cases, which kind of technology should be chosen as well. Um, would, what is the best technology for that uh, developed use case? We are developing in-house our own solution, which is based on a platform and on top dedicated apps or application for each use case. We are doing the implementation, but it's more or less very simple because we have an, a, an approach that, that everything is done by um, customization or um, configuration rather than by developing. And as well, we supporting afterwards our customer, we are supporting as well for other automotive customers 24 times seven all over all over the globe. Let me start on that because if you're talking about what is location, what is location means in a factory or in a logistic hall to, to understand where we are. Everybody knows a GPS system. A GPS system is based on satellites which are in the orbit and uh, the, um, the car receive this information of the satellite. You need normally at least three satellites in order to have a precise um, um, a, a location of your car. But to be frank, such a dot in the map at the beginning would be precisely by 10 to 30 meters. So what makes it precisely in your view is the software, your navigation system itself, because they are knowing on which street you are driving. So sometimes you have seen if, you, if your data are not accurate in your navigation system, that the, the, you know, the, the data will not shown in a correct way. So, and if we're talking about an indoor um, uh, um, location system, it's similar the same. You see, you have on the top of the roof, 
you have also kind of satellites. So based on the technology which you're using, it could be BLE, which is standing for Bluetooth Low Energy, or um, UWB means it's standing for ultra wideband. The same concept, you have to have some fixed nodes in, 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 in your hall, and you are taking or you're putting a transponder on the object which you like to drag. This object in this case is a forklift, but it could be also a box, it could be also a car, it could be also an, an, an order. So in the similar this concept, if you are using straight away the technology out of this location systems, the dot will swapping around and you will have a precisely by, I don't know, five to 10 meters based on the technology. And our software is doing a context based on this uh, tech. What it means that, you know, you're describing in our software, what are you taking? It is an, 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 an order or it is an, an, an forklift. This means we could use uh, data behind that object in order to make the location seamless for your eyes. This is the concept. So and at the end, we are the difference is between that we have a variable tags or variable nodes which you put on your um, on 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 your object which you like to drag and you see a huge variety on on different tags based on also on the technology again gps is standing for global positioning ble is for bluetooth low energy uwb is standing for ultra wideband and the same what what you have to put on the wall you're putting some fixed nodes which called on some areas uh, sensors, locators, speaking, whatever you how name it. But the concept is the same. They have the side on, on the text and, and based on, on the triangulation that they, they brings you an XY set. Okay. So and based on that technology and underneath our software, you could use, uh, you can serve several use cases. For example, you can do inside and hall a very precise uh, location because you like to have an, um, a tool control system in place or you like to have your, 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 your uh, uh, warehouse uh, concept in, in place. Outside, you like to have an, only an identification. So that means I have seen an object in that area. You could use also as well the GPS and so on. And, and our technology combines all of this into one platform and shows you afterwards this one single event which is important. So and the concept is similar simple. We have an open street map which you put underneath your 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 uh, uh, the 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 tracking area. You 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 paint on a high level your the object the event zones what happened if an if 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 a tech is is entering such a zone we have a high level easy configuration and no code environment and out of that you get the full uh, uh, real time environment with Senki diagrams and so on. And out of that we have already implemented use cases which I show you afterwards some uh, example, for example, simple finding products and assets. So simple automatic environments. Simple monitoring of industrial trucks could be, as I, as I said, a forklift. So um, uh, helping our, our, our companies or our partners shipping financial goods and so on. This is based on this technology, uh, already apps which are available, which our uh, customers can use. The importance of that is this are products which we are there, which we could easily implement and have already several customers which are using that. But important for our customers is the concept because at the end, what are you doing? You like, for example, you like to detect an, an object in a dedicated area. You like to detect an interaction between two objects. One could be a static object, one could be a moving object. I'll show you an example. So you like to have um, the historical data, the snail drive of, of that. And also you like to have the visualization on your map. In this example, which you're doing with our software, you're building, for example, a cube around a moving object and you're putting a cube about a person or a handheld what the person is doing. 
and as soon the person will entering into this this zone an event occurs and this event could be done several things again the concept is always the same an object is moving into an area and an event occurs and i show you for example what could happen so you could say a forklift brings a material into a product area could be say oh uh, install the machine with the right parameters in order which kind of product is coming next so what kind of logistic a trail is needed for the next part all about because you're creating zone and you're creating event automatically out of the system and this will be shown easily afterwards in in a map and you have an a, 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 a real-time flow a real-time view on the factory out of that we have customers for example which doing production logistics which are um, doing the bill of materials over and using our system in order to get much more clarity in, into the plant. Another example, for example, this customer, he has a factory, he's producing uh, uh, screws, and he, you see here in the map, he has more than 5,000 um, uh, 5, uh, orders which floating around it's floating around and the interesting part is in the past in you see this small little boxes here the customer has within this boxes he has the the order cards he has the 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 task card what has to be done next and what was the worker was doing he was really jumping up try to catch the card in order to see what has to be done next with our system he has a simple find and search he's giving in the the order number you see here this red little button and he hit the button and out of the button he, he he get immediately feedback on which box he has to look after which kind or which box is the right order the right um uh, product the right asset what he's looking after so uh one last comment on that the the uh, th this company was able to to increase 15 percent efficiency by using only such simple search and find uh, algorithms as well to have you know the factory in 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 um yeah um yeah, yeah in 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 a fully blend here okay yes so again the the concept from our software is no matter what kind of technology underneath we like to give the, the right XYZ coordinates to our customers by using our system. One last word, this customer here is using uh, BLE, Bluetooth Low Energy, and uh, I am very proud that also uh, ZumTobel is going in that direction in order to build in some BLE components directly to the Lightnows. If you have further question, don't hesitate to call me. My name is Peter, as I said before, and I'm really happy to be here in this event. And we are very happy to have you here, Peter. Thank you so much <laughs> for the thank presentation. And we'll see you in a second for our panel discussion. Yeah, great. Yeah, so we received some examples uh, how to do identification, location. Uh, I think we will discuss this further in a second as well in our panel discussion. But now our next presentation will be from Dresden Sommer, an international consultancy that focuses on the building and real estate sector. And to this trialogue, we are welcoming today Ivo Angern, Head of Engineering for Consulting and Manager at Dresden Sommer Switzerland. And he will be actually speaking about two of the biggest challenges that we have at the moment, digitalization and decarbonization. Carbonization. So how can digitalization actually support sustainability and which aspects of sustainability are important in logistics and logistics properties? That's what he will show us. And I know he's brought us also a lot of examples. So uh, please welcome Ivo Angen. I think you're still on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so hi Anja, <laughs> hi, hi everyone, uh, hi from Switzerland, uh, actually on my side of the Rhine it's not snowing currently in Zurich, but uh, it was snowing in the night and uh, we're looking forward to a great ski season. Um, so uh, yes, as you said, I will talking today about uh, not only digitization, but also um, uh, sustainability 
and the way to zero carbon. I hope you can see my screen very well right now. Um, just check this here. And uh, yes, I, my name, uh, as I said, Ivo Angern. I'm working for Dresden Somos Switzerland, not far from Dornwirn. I'm a manager, head of engineering consulting, dealing with the, those two topics in our consulting business. Just a little bit of uh, background about Dresden Sommer. Um, we are actually today more closely to 4,500 employees uh, globally with a strong uh, presence across uh, Europe. And uh, we are supporting the whole real estate industry from uh, inception investment over construction, reconstruction over to operation of uh, buildings. In the logistics sectors, uh, we do our services like consulting, planning, construction and supporting operation. I will not bore you more uh, with that. Now, if we talk about the digitization and uh, smart buildings for smart logistics, I uh, want to start, of course, with the bigger context. And as uh, already mentioned by Anja, um, the question is, why do we do things and what do we have to observe? And if we're talking ab about today, about enterprises, uh, manufacturing facilities and logistics uh, companies, of course, climate change, as very nicely mentioned and uh, presented by Rudy before as well for Volvo trucks, is one of the biggest challenges that is, that is uh, tackling us today. This has a number of implications, especially at EU level, uh, which you have to observe. And if you look at those uh, couple of keywords here, uh, these are outlining some of the things that the companies will need to report from 2023 on in terms of their greenhouse gas emissions, in terms of their energy efficiency, in terms of their carbon intensity of their areas, buildings and production facilities. So these alone is already uh, quite a challenge and actually it can be addressed only with digitalization. Has nothing to do so much with logistics yet, but I will come to that back in a minute. Now, if we talk uh, about uh, our approach to digitalization uh, in buildings in general and uh, buildings for uh, logistics in particular, uh, we of course start at the front. And uh, the first thing before you go into implementation of all those nice technologies that are available today, be it location or automated vehicles or whatever you, you name it, we have to start with uh, design thinking and requirement management. This is nothing very new but uh, uh, it is surprising how often in digitization project it is not started there. And uh, the first thing you have to ask yourself is actually who's, who are the people that deal with it? Because what we do with digitization is always to support uh, people in either doing their job better, in either achieving their targets uh, uh, in more efficient way, in being more healthy or, uh, or secure in their operations. So we have to look at different perspectives of different people and look at those different personas. And even if you're looking at the logistics uh, warehouse, it's not only some logistics experts uh, and some drivers of uh, forklifts that are in uh, there, but you have a number of different personas. And if you look at those personas and the different use cases, actually the different activities they do today, and you have an overall map of what's going on in such a location, you have a huge number of potential use cases you can address uh, with digitization. In terms of logistics, uh, you can see some of the pictures here. We have already seen some of those in the presentations before and after. I think you will know most of those uh, topics. These are the, the hot topics discussed in uh, logistics uh, digitization. Now, uh, the question is, what is really creating value added for you and your employees in this? And this is something that is quite different for different companies. To make things more complex, in an enterprise like Volvo Trucks uh, in Kent, you don't only have the logistics parts that are managed there, but you have uh, office space, uh, you have employees that uh, look for uh, a, uh, a car pickup uh, thing, you have to uh, look at the energy management, already mentioned by Rudy as well. Uh, you have to deal with entry of uh, people, of employees, but also visitors, consultants, customers, suppliers into your facilities. All of these uh, topics come together if you talk about digitization. And then another perspective is uh, facility management, dealing more with uh, the building uh, infrastructure rather than the production facilities. 
uh, they of course have different use cases again and you can imagine that if you combine all of those views that the topic is becoming quite complicated to address. Now how do we addre address this? One of the topics is uh, actually we call it customer smart buildings or customer smart logistics buildings because uh, obviously every company and every manufacturer, every logistics company need a different concept for digitization. There is not one recipe uh, for the uh, digital logistics building, but this needs to be looked at really uh, individually. The second aspect of our solution space is that actually our observation is there's no lack of data, there's no lack of senses, there's no lack of digital data, even if there's lots of paper around still. But the question is, how do our, are those different aspects and senses of, an uh, of a building connected to each other? Um, often it is not connected at all, it's not integrated, it's not useful. So our vision is actually look at the human as an inspiration with a, uh, with a brain, with a uh, backbone, with uh, connecting all, uh, via the nerves all the sensing elements of the, of the body uh, to make really integrated use of all the data uh, together. And uh, if you have a look at the systems, the digital systems that are probably installed at your location and factory, you will see a number of different systems. And the question, of course, again, is which systems need to be connected? Because there's too many possibilities that you can just say everything needs to be connected to everything. Um, this is not a very uh, eff effective uh, way to do it, but it's really important to look at the overall uh, perspective of what needs to be connected to what. And last but not least, you don't just have to think at today's uh, picture, but you need to look at the future. So if we call it being IoT ready, we have seen IoT based systems like location systems or presence detection, uh, lighting, the role of lighting of all of that. Um, the topic is you need to be ready for the future uh, systems and the future technologies, which we don't even know today. If you look at the life cycle of a building being uh, 20 to 50 years, you need to build an infrastructure that can handle the systems of tomorrow, the day after tomorrow and 10 to 20 years. So if you go about that, the most important question for each of you is what do you really want to achieve? So looking at the, some of the logistics use cases again uh, is where is uh, the value being created? This can be in the overall uh, digital dis dispatching uh, area where you get your, uh, your trucks arriving at uh, the factory. Of course, it's like often a question of uh, being, knowing the right, having the right information at the right time and the right place. Uh, we have already uh, seen and heard about the uh, automated guided vehicles. Of course, also this has some uh, implications for the basic infrastructure of the buildings. Same for efficiency drivers like inventory by drones, or if you go a little bit beyond uh, the logistics, uh, keyless entry. So dynamic access uh, right management uh, is be beyond handling keys and uh, batches and so on. This is really outdated uh, technology and creating lots of pain for lots of people who could do uh, smarter things in those uh, areas. You have to extend your horizon by including visitors, suppliers, customers. And today's technology with uh, keyless entry based on uh, smartphones or other technology is really allowing you to do a much more efficient and targeted use of your access management without uh, the risk of losing keys, uh, re-exchanging locks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we have already heard a lot about uh, asset tracking with location services. Um, of course, also occupancy and actually the utilization of space is one of the most underestimated areas of potential savings, be that in offices or, uh, or uh, logistics buildings. If you have such areas like Volvo trucks in, in Ghent, of course, such a huge space, it is clear that some of this space is probably underutilized and could be better uh, utilized uh, in the future if you only know how it is utilized. And this is uh, something that is quite obvious. It's not very complicated to get this uh, data. You have 
many sensors, lighting fixtures, um, on-off uh, signals from those lightings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And just mapping out what is there can give you already some picture of okay, which areas are really used, which ones are not. If they're not used, why are they not used? Is there not a better used utilization of space? So rather than thinking about the expansion of your building area uh, by another 50%, think about how to reutilize your area uh, somewhat uh, smarter. Um, Ivo, just a second. Um, we can't see your presentation anymore for any reason. Oh. Um, I don't know if you switched Sorry. it off, because <laughs> that oh. would be actually quite uh, nice to see all those examples you I brought. See. Sorry. <laughs> all uh, good. I have, uh, I see, still see something, but I will just change it once again. I think now you should see it again. Yes, perfect. Okay, I'm very sorry about that. I was uh, coming from uh, the occupancy and asset tracking. Another topic of today is, of course, uh, intelligent charging uh, with, for e-mobility trucks and vehicle of employees. Again, another system, typically another uh, integration uh, challenge uh, that needs to be addressed. And it's very uh, important to think before you start installing of the, all of this, how to integrate that to an overall concept and brain. Now, if we have all of these digitalization topics, of course, we also have some, not just opportunities, but also some risks. Of course, cybersecurity is becoming uh, a major uh, importance of today. Um, I think Rudy mentioned also the difficulty of IT to deal with uh, additional networks and uh, uh, the data transmission between networks. Yes, this needs to be looked at at the very early stage. The topic is really, of course, uh, with an installed base, you cannot change everything at the, at the same time. But if you think about a new building and the basic infrastructure for a new building and all those systems that will enter these buildings, it's extremely important that you have a cybersecurity concept from the start on, that you have a clear requirements for your suppliers of system, what are the mandatory requirements in terms of cybersecurity in order to uh, not avoid, uh, uh, arrive with uh, lots of risks and a uh, big mess. Also data privacy and regulation, I think still vastly underestimated. Uh, regulation is increasing, especially in Europe, and you need to be able to uh, deal and manage the data that is being collected and uh, and used. Of course, it has a huge value. Data is the gold of, and oil of uh, today, but uh, you have to be aware of the regulation and of the implication it has, this has for your operations. How can we help you uh, to deal with this jungle and many questions? There are uh, emerging standards uh, for uh, certification. First of all, from our own side, we offer a so-called digital ready check for existing buildings and new construction projects. The purpose of this is actually to enable you to see where do you stand with your project of, or with your building in terms of the basic infrastructure. Is it ready for all your digitization projects? Uh, are there major risks? risks or lacks that need to be addressed before you start with uh, additional nice uh, fancy topics. Um, the second one, uh, area is now there's emerging more and more smart building certifications that are actually enabling you to make sure and also communicate to your customers, suppliers and the business partners that uh, your uh, uh, building, your uh, factory is actually up to date with managing the basic infrastructure needs uh, for these digital uh, processes of today and the future, and also to give security to your customers and uh, suppliers that you deal with uh, cybersecurity, data protection, etc., in the right way. An example on the top right here is Hammer Brooklyn in Hamburg, uh, a recent example that got the really uh, high score on the, the smart building certification and is being regarded as one of the smartest buildings across Europe today. Um, from uh, Dresden Soma, we have also worked on a so-called digitally approved uh, criteria catalog together with our partners from the uh, Technical University in Aachen, uh, where we also uh, evaluate lots of uh, different uh, logistics buildings, uh, manufacturing sites and so on. And we know quite well what are the main obstacles and tips 
uh, pitfalls you can uh, uh, find yourself in if you want to start implementing your digitization projects. So if you're not quite sure where you stand with the basic infrastructure, uh, we can help you very well uh, to have a first glance of what are the basic um, uh, exercises you need to do first. And now maybe back to uh, the, the start, if we combine sustainability and digitization, if one of your main value adds of digitization is also to contribute to sustainability, I just want to give you an outlook that uh, sustainability may be beyond and measuring uh, the energy and uh, being able to predict how much energy you, you consume tomorrow and, to, uh, and uh, two days from now. But uh, looking at this very nice logistics projects of uh, Levi's uh, called Project Orion. Uh, so the, the idea here is to create a warehouse that has a positive uh, CO2 carbon footprint. And this not only in terms of operation, that means uh, reducing the uh, fossil energy used to operate the building, but also in terms of the construction of the building, because today it's quite I would say easy or very well known how to build an, uh, a building that can be operated in a carbon neutral or almost carbon zero way. But to construct a building, this is a much harder, uh, harder uh, challenge. So here the cradle to cradle or circular economy principles apply. Uh, we look not only at the at the consumption of energy, but also the flexibility and recyclability of materials used, the material health, uh, of course, the use of renewable energies and the waste, uh, water resources, but up to the society impact of the construction. So here another couple of examples of what can be looked at and, uh, on in terms of material uh, cycles, in terms of healthy buildings, in terms of uh, positive energy uh, buildings, uh, up to biodiversity and uh, using waste as nutrition to create new products and services of the future. So this is coming uh, to the end from uh, my side. I'm uh, very happy to uh, continue the discussion afterwards in the panel or also in the breakout room after uh, the break and feel free to contact me for any further question. Perfect, that's what we are going to do. Thank you so much for showing us all those examples of smart buildings, very interesting. Uh, thank you and we will discuss this further in a second. Okay, so from Ivo we learned now that buildings, how can buildings can be smart. From Peter before that, we've heard how important it is to always know where my products, my materials are and how that works. Now actually everything kind of comes together because we all need this for our last mile management. So it's a big and crucial point, a big challenge in logistics to manage that last mile. And how to do that, we are going to find out now by um, a Swiss company called Bossart. And I would like to welcome here on a remote connection, Urs Göttinger. He is the CTO of Bossart and will explain us how materials in factories can be delivered to workstations in a very smart and efficient way. I'm excited to find out. Hello, Urs. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <coughs> Thank you for inviting me here that I can explain. Okay. I don't know. Do you see my... Yeah, I only see a part of it. Let's try this again. Hmm. Maybe you could just share that again. Yes, perfect. That looks better. Not for me. Um, we can see um, your presentation in the, not in the presentation modus yet. So just click on the yes, perfect. Okay, so looks better then. Okay, sorry for that. So then uh, for, I will start with my presentation. For any reason, we don't see it in presentation mode. I don't know why, <laughs> if it just takes a second. So, let me try it again. <laughs> Once more, third time right. <laughs> so perfect, now it looks great. 
Okay, thank you. So then let's start how we bring, how we do this inter intelligent material supply for workstation with last mile management. So we are happy we have a building, we are happy we have lights, but uh, maybe uh, I will start with introduce uh, my company, Bossart. So we are an international trading uh, company with engineering and logistic solutions. Our headquarters are in Zug in Switzerland. We are in 30 countries in 80 locations and it's about two and a half thousand employees. So we have also a joint venture with SSC Marketag. SSC Marketag is the world leader of a smart e-paper display. So may if you go to your uh, retail and buy some food, then you may will see this, this intelligent uh, labels on uh, with the price tag. This is a startup that uh, supports technology and solutions and they have their smart industrial IoT platform called Zepio. The PDI and Bossert, both of them are uh, have access to this technology. I will explain now in the next uh, few minutes. So the business model of Bossert in general is the product. So we delivering fastener technology solutions. So there's 1 million different parts that we serve to our customer all over the world. Then we have a part about engineering, what we call assembly technology expert, how we calculate fastener, do streamlining of assortment, or helping you do uh, an efficient assembly process. And the third core competence that we have is the smart factory logistics. That's how we bring the material from our warehouse to your docks and then maybe also to your working place. If you have your company, then maybe it's not that, uh, that, that, that clear like here, but there is material that arrives the, the building. Then maybe you have a supermarket or a central warehouse. Then you maybe have a main line. You have some pre-working stations that are locked uh, close to the main line. Then you have pre-assembly areas and all these need material and maybe uh, lots of different small screws, nuts, bolts, O-rings or whatever, and also heavier parts. And to support this material flow, we have different uh, system and solutions. And in the first step, I will explain you uh, two of our systems, and one is our smart bin cloud. This is in a way a bin and a scale under the bin. And we have an electronic display here, where we can describe the product, what is in, but we can also bring some status information. So with this bin, we get uh, weight data. This weight data we send to our system, and here we interpret it and find out if we have to order parts or not. If we have to order, we send the, the replenishment order to the warehouse, to our warehouse or to warehouses of other suppliers. We consolidate the material, ship it to the customer, and maybe a person of us or the customer itself does refill this bin. And this bin does again measure that the weight goes up. And then we have, uh, we have, we know the material has arrived, arrived the point of use. So we have a full cycle, cycle control and is uh, very transparent. Another system is our smart label system. So here is in a way missing the, the scale. So it's a semi-automated system. It's often used at workplaces where the assembly guy is there and, and he knows when he needs additional material that he push a button here. And then we have the same process that we get the signal to the supplier. We get the consolidated shipment and the material is refilled and you are uh, ready to assemble. So that's in a way the systems below. And one service out of this we can do with such digital system. By the way, we have already about 350,000 scales all over the world in uh, uh, at our customers. And <clears throat> with this last mile management, we have the chance to bring in the material to the point of use. And often this is not so a simple thing because these productions are yeah, 
They are packed with machines, with working places, and maybe looks like this. Or here we need the material in this bins here where they they assemble boogies for trains. Or what you see here, we need the material really at this place. Here we will assemble products and we need the screws, nuts, bolts, and everything to uh, accessible for the, the workers in the assembly areas. Also here one is maybe not the best solution for logistics, but maybe a good solution to assemble here these products, but it's not, it's, it's somehow difficult to refill this, to know what to refill, and we want to reduce this, this uh, amount of work. Often this last mile from a central Kanban pool or from a warehouse, it's not well organized. Of course, there are some uh, some uh, large company, they have good organization, but in the mid and small, mid size and small size company, it's often, it's maybe a two bin system. Someone has to collect bins and go back and grab material, or even the assembly personnel has to go and grab material by themselves. That's often not very efficient. There's a lot of ways you do wrong, you may not use the optimized way. And now imagine you will, you will always uh, need and uh, know which parts are needed, when they are needed and where they are needed. If you have this information in a nice system, very transparent, maybe also as a standalone independent system to not integrate in, in all your ERP and different uh, system. So just simple to build up then we end up with a last mile management. With a last mile management, we try to do this all more efficient. We want to digitalize the information flow. We want to support the milk runner, uh, what they have to pick, how they have to pick, and where to bring. And that we do with uh, our uh, two systems, smart label or smart bin. So imagine you have either your smart pin or your smart labels at these working places. And in the smart pin, if the, the stock goes down, then the signal will be created automatically. Or maybe here you have some smart label, the worker press the button because he thinks he needs additional material. So this information goes uh, to the last man management system. And from here, we create an electronic picking list. So it's not a paper we print out, it's real on a tablet or on a phone that you know what to pick. Now your milk runner has this tablet on his trolley and then he, get, he will be guided through the picking area in an efficient way. So we know the best way to pick these goods. So he has not to run from the first to the last rack and back to the third one and so on. So it's really efficient then going through here and if you have to pick in another warehouse, also this will be uh, done in an optimal uh, route. If the milk runner has picked the material, the system calculates now what's the, uh, the, the right way or the optimal way to unload the material, and he will uh, advise the, the milk runner which location he has to go and what he has to refill, and so he will be guided through the factory. And because everything is digital, in an in a example, you have nothing to deliver here, then the route will be going direct this way and he can save then uh, some, yeah, some distance and time uh, to refill the material. So the, the, the whole thing runs on an app. So you can either do this on a phone or maybe a little more comfortable on a tablet because then you have bigger, bigger uh, information in here. Now it says, okay, go to the first track, the 17th box and pick 100 pieces. And then if you have done this, you just swipe and say, okay, it's picked. And then it, it uh, uh, tells you where you have to go then you have to go to section two and the one you have, uh, you can take this, this uh, box number one and put this to the, in the first track in the first box in this section two. 
if you have done this, you just swipe and then uh, this is uh, defined or confirmed. So to repeat here, so when you have on your location, and that could be tons, there's maybe 50 to 100 different locations where you have hundreds or thousands of boxes, you can either define the demand via the scale, it's fully automated, or via the smart label. By the way, here we have also an LED on it. So with the LED, then we can also support pick by light and put by light. So to help the milk runner to find the product much faster. So if we have here this, this information, what we have to deliver, so we'll transfer it and put it to an electronic uh, picking list on the tablet. And we can also integrate this, the warehouse of the customer or even an automated warehouse that this system then send the data file to this automated warehouse. This automated warehouse will pick the goods and make it ready. And if it confirms back to last man management, then the milk render will be informed that he can pick up this material also. And then he will be guided through the factory uh, to the right uh, locations where he has to unload the material he has loaded to his trolley or whatever and then he can do the refill here and then everything is uh, is, is, is fine it's organized it's uh, more efficient if i put this together so we have uh, an optimized material flow it's a reduction of movement it's also re flexible to reconfigure for reconfiguration so everything can be done on the app so you have not to run to the office to the screen and we can increase the efficiency as an example also here with HGVs. So last man management is able to talk to HGVs or other automated uh, transporting systems. So you can say, okay, you have a milk runner who does just do the picking and then you send it automatically to the next building and there is another logistic in that do the unload. The good thing is also the full transparency you don't have, how many times you have to refill this box or the other box with which quantities. And because we have dozens of these already uh, operating, we have a high reliability with this system. And yeah, it is here to work seven uh, days, 24 hours. So that's uh, uh, the, in, a, in, in a short time uh, to explain uh, what does our last mile management. And you can get it from BOSSOT or from PDI Digital. And if you have questions, we will see, I will see you later on in uh, breakout room number two. Yes, thank you for now, Urs, exactly. Um, the questions you will be asking in the panel discussion, actually. Um, so if you have any questions, post them in the chat and then Urs will also answer them later. But Urs, uh, thank you so much for now and I see you in just about 10 minutes. Thank you. So it is already time for the last presentation of today before we start our panel discussion. And this presentation now will actually be a very good bridge to our panel discussion. It's where actually everything that we've learned today comes together and we will find out which role does actually lighting play in the digitization of logistics. So how can lighting become the platform for industry 4.0 and how can digital services help? Well, I'm about to be welcoming a true expert in digital services, Ralf Müller. He has been working at Zomtobel for 16 years now and he is the senior consultant for digital services with an advanced knowledge of illumination and lighting control systems. Was that not a wonderful <laughs> moderation here for you, Ralf? In indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome and I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Anja. Thank you. Thank you. What a nice stage. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, indeed, I would like to take uh, the opportunity to build a bridge back to what we heard, have heard uh, to us as a lighting company, as a lighting manufacturer. Um, my um, presentation is having digital services um, 
as natural, as obvious as good lighting. Um, a building for logistics, for industries, have so many different areas um, for um, the visual tasks. Outside areas, perimeter areas for load base, high bay uh, rooms uh, or low bay, fast moving devices or office work. They all need different uh, requirements or have different requirements for visual tasks. And we all know a good high quality lighting solution can help, can support in reducing failures um, improving well-being of the employees, staying in the focus, and all that with a reduced consumption of energy. Staying a company, your company, in a business successful needs adjustment. It's not easy to stay them in the, uh, at that time. What is super quickly changing, we all know that. We have heard before that we need flexibility, that we need to adjust processes, as an example. I don't want to talk too much about our lighting solutions um, um, as they are quality lighting um, or lighting control system, even not about um, our emergency systems. There, you know us since decades being a good uh, partner um, in your business. I would like to take the opportunity um, to work with the lighting infrastructure beyond the typical lighting um, ideas or lighting uh, functionalities. Luminaires are all over the place in the buildings. They are everywhere. They are powered, mains powered, and normally fixed mounted. And since that time um, that lighting controls are obvious in the buildings, they are also networked to control systems. Adding this with new kind of sensors now would make us able or makes us able to grab data. And these data is now, as we heard also on, in the speeches before, is super important not only take them and store them wherever, it is super essential to do something with, to have some learnings out of that data. And that is um, the third step uh, with algorithms, with systems to combine them, enrich these data and store for them for further or for future um, needs uh, to combine that with something out of the past. That is as important and that's what we call a lighting, a digital lighting solution, our digital services, what gives us transparency, drives efficiency and productiv productivity and hopefully as minimum as minimal in uh, technical solutions, it um, decreases a bit the complexi complexity in the systems. Digital services are mainly split in two big segments. The first segment is the monitoring. Monitoring means that we take data from the technical systems, dimming levels, operating hours, what gives us a real-time view about the systems. Additional to that, we could use that infrastructure of the lighting to transport data from ambient sensors, which measures the air temperature, um, the air humidity, or CO2 level, what is today very important. Um, many people, small rooms, high level of CO2. Um, but it's also possible to use that infrastructure or that monitoring uh, functionality to grab data from, from machines. So means sensors for um, vibrations or um, rotations per minute, as an example, what gives us an information um, and or data to make information out of that. The second topic is that location-based service. 
Location-based services are in the focusing, uh, focusing in the center to the position of something. It can be a material, can be a tool, it can be people as well. Gives us the opportunity to um, do asset tracking, what we have heard earlier many times, uh, but also would give us a chance to uh, generate an indoor navigation system. For the moment, I would like to concentrate a little bit on that asset tracking, so positioning of goods or job cards, what helps us in um, automated, um, automated real-time inventory, as an example, or at the end gives us a possibility to do way passes, uh, analysis, and we see in a heat map, as an, as an example, where we have points with high interest or uh, which are heavy occupied where we can try to use our facility in a broader way and um, make some points a bit less traffic. For that we have two technologies. One technology we call it uh, the positioning uh, by a wireless IoT mesh. It's a completely full a radio-based system, Bluetooth-based system, where we have integrated the so-called anchor nodes into the lighting infrastructure, into the tecton or into craft luminaires directly in. And they are span a mesh um, of a network and it depends on the use case. And that is a big difference why we have different, different technology it depends on the use case, uh, which accuracy of the position you need. Maybe it's only two up to five meters and these wireless IoT mesh is a perfect choice. Also, if you need not every second an update um, of the position, if it is good enough to have it half a minute or every five minutes only, then this technology where you do not need any additional data cabling that is brilliant. The second technology is at what we call high accuracy positioning. With that high accuracy positioning, we at the end use the same infrastructure. We have so-called locators, antennas, which I call uh, look, uh, I show you uh, later on, um, are mounted to the Tecton trunking system. And with the help of that, um, it is possible to have uh, the localization or the positioning of devices in real time. So many times a second um, by refreshing the positioning. And with an accuracy less a meter, what is super precise. And even here in our light forum, we have installed that. And I would love to show it you, but unfortunately um, we be online only. However, uh, you could see how precise it is down to less half meter to plus minus 20 centimeters, something like that in different areas. There is a specific, during planning, uh, there is a specific need to look to um, interferences, but at the end it works brilliant because these locators are at the same place needed where also the luminaires are um, so luminaires are mounted. So at the end, um, I'm happy to show you something later on in um, the breakout sessions uh, or maybe now in the discussion, uh, we will see. And I'm looking forward um, now to the panel discussion with you, Anja. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Ralf. This is your virtual applause. <laughs> <laughs> so as you said, it is now time for our panel discussion. So please, all speakers uh, from just now, please switch back on your microphone and your camera. And you, dear participants, it's now time for you to be interactive. Please ask questions here to our speakers because we thought, hey, why not save you some time? And uh, if you have any questions to our experts, then please tell them as to us now because we won't go into the breakout sessions later. So 
Okay, so uh, welcome back here. Uh, Ralf Müller, of course, Urs Göttinger, Peter Partner, Ivo Angern and Rudi van Leeuwen. It's nice to have you here all back with us. So Ralf, maybe I start with you. So you've, uh, bef because you've been the last speaker, you've heard all the presentations uh, before that. And I would just be really interested that from all the solutions and products we've just uh, talked about, was there anything for you where you were like, okay, this was kind of surprising or new, or are you uh, an expert and you've known already everything? <laughs> <laughs> you, I never know everything. <laughs> uh, I would say um, not really big news for me as I'm a professional acting in that. But um, one thing what I've learned is um, to see um, how the whole chain of that works. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, um, from taking in consideration the needs of the company, yeah. what digital service could help down to all the technical possibilities together with all our partners to realize them. That is, in my opinion, the essential thing what we can do all together and only. Exactly. That's that's a very good point. And I think this would be a good start for our discussion now as well. So if um, the people, the participants that have been listening to us now think, well, this all sounds great, uh, some really great solutions there. But where do I actually start in my journey of digitalization? Like what should I actually do? What kind of requirements do I need in the beginning? So I would like to ask this question uh, to Ivo. What is uh, what you tell your clients when they come to you at the start of their journey or when they want to realize a certain project? Well, I would say uh, at a start, typically uh, people come to us and say, yes, they want to have a digital factory or they want to have started a big digitalization program. The third, first thing of all, of course, is to get an understanding of they really want to want what they want to achieve. Digitalization is never a purpose by itself. Digitalization is a, a tool, an enabler to create, uh, to do optimization of processes, uh, to do better workplaces, uh, to support people in doing their jobs better. And to find out this is typically the first hurdle in most of the digitalization projects. Of course, if uh, people very exactly know what they want to do, then it's relatively easy. It's a typical project management and then the, 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 the idea is rather just start and do something and don't uh, start with big uh, concepts, but with many of uh, especially also uh, projects, real estate focused projects, uh, the, the link between the operations, the real need of the production and the workers in the factories and the needs for real estate is something that needs to be established first before you go really into the technology options, into the use cases and into the specific value adds and technologies, how to solve that. Yes, I think this is how it's supposed to be. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Rudy, is that exactly how you did it in the beginning of uh, your journey, being a project manager? How was that for you? Oh. I think you're muted, Rudy. Yeah. Sorry. As, uh, as real estate, uh, we, our target is uh, to build buildings that our management needs. The questions come from there. And I feel that we uh, are now in a phase that we are coming closer and closer to the people uh, of the management uh, of logistics, for example, and, and uh, production. Uh, because we can, we can build a building with stones, uh, with light and uh, with uh, Wi-Fi. But now there are coming more and more questions, how you can help us with this, how you can help us with this, what will be the standardization for the future? And this um, I'm, I'm working on. So uh, I hope that uh, data um, that we can make available for them, they can use in their, in their processes. That's what that's my target for the future. So I'm hearing very interesting discussions and availabilities that I will take with me uh, for the future. That's good to know. So data to have all the data as a requirements or what would you <coughs> say uh, was what what is uh, what would be your answer to this question? Like what do you need to start? What kind of requirements? In general, it's good to have an overview where do you want to go at the end. But uh, what we think is uh, it's also important to start, not to do too much uh, investigation and big projects and everything. So do start, make an experiment with some digitalization projects 
So then you also get the feeling how people will accept this. And at the end, it's not only the technology we implement here, it's at the end people, they have to work with them and they have to accept this and, uh, and they have to have a benefit out of it. And then that you learn best if you try something, maybe if to speak with my words, do a last mile management in one department or yeah. uh, only at one working place and get some experience out of it. And I would say start is the first, start make experiments and then uh, bring it together in a in a wall system at the end okay so in the end it comes kind of down to the people that's what i've discussed with uh, martin earlier as well um, maybe you can tell us about some concrete measures that you've implemented in your companies like how did you take the employees with you on this journey um, maybe peter can you start yeah, first of all, it's quite interesting. We see that more and more companies established kind of an innovation department or an IoT department. So the good thing is they're trying a lot of technology by not knowing what is the result afterwards. So I think this is at the end good. On the other side, it's always driven, new technology driven by pain points. So I'm currently, it's not only the COVID crisis, we have also the crisis of less semiconductor products and therefore you know, the guys have really a need and, and do starting. And we see a lot of projects popping up currently, for example, finding stuff. It's unbelievable simple normally, you think. But now the technology is there and they will start and, and, and get benefit out of it. For me, it's very important immediately to show results. And then you will get and buy in from the technology immediately from the, from the key people, for sure, for sure. Okay, so results is uh, your answer. Ralf, I'm looking at you. Is that also something uh, that you would recommend and how is that your clients? Uh, well, I think um, what we heard, ha have heard from our colleague, my colleague Martin earlier, um, as he said, honestly. Mm, honesty, yeah. Honestly, uh, communication. So being all, um, or bringing uh, a clear statement, what is happening now in the factor? What is our plan to do in the next future, in the near future? That they are not surprised any, any morning, oh, there is a change here and there, mm -hmm. and then they do not feel very confident. So from that point, I think the communication thing is the most essential, what you should do. Yeah. It's interesting. We're actually talking about technology, but in the end, it comes down to people and communication. Ivo, would you like to add something to this? Yeah, yes, of course. It's it's always about people. Uh, it's the, the needs of, of uh, people, be it managers or be it worker assembly at the assembly line. And uh, the other thing next to communication is the involvement of the directly uh, concerned people because they have the ideas they know from their daily operation where are the pain points which are the optimization potentials and if you involve them in the solution finding of course not all but if you involve selected people in the solution finding also in our experience the acceptance then of the solution that have been developed are much better than if you just come and say now this is the new solution this is how you should work from now on uh, because this is creating better results in terms of uh, they know what problems they want to solve and the second better acceptance because uh, they, they do work with it and uh, they're, they're the experts actually on what we want to do. So it's important that if you really want to roll out such projects that you have the involvement of the concerned people and not just the, the IoT or innovation department. Of course, they can bring all the ideas. We also do this such uh, lots of uh, tests uh, with uh, different systems uh, in our uh, smart commercial building center in, in Aachen, where also Sumtobel uh, is involved, where we try out uh, to combine different things. But at the end, it comes really down to who are we doing this for and what is his uh, benefit? And if those people understand why we do that and are involved in the solution finding, this is a recipe for success. That's your recipe for success. I'm always waiting, like gentlemen, if you would like to jump in on any point and please do so. <laughs> Um, but okay, um, so we've talked now a lot about people, about employees. Um, I would like to talk a bit about money. <laughs> this is uh, something that Rudy already really nicely integrated into his presentation. So all those questions that are coming from management. Okay, when is this actually uh, repaying this investment? You know, how long will it take? What is it? 
So all those KPIs. So this is something I would like to discuss with you a little bit more. Um, how long does it take for those investments and how do you communicate this to your management? Uh, Ralf, I'm looking at you. <laughs> <laughs> what do you, um, how do you argue then with your clients and, and those financial, well, you know, <laughs> departments? Yeah, that's, it's always not an easy discussion because mostly they came up or start with, I would like to do something smart or I need to create a building and it should be a smart building. It must be a smart building. Mm -hmm. What's the return of investment? Mm -hmm. uh, what does it cost? And then I say, say stop. We have first to discuss about what's your use case. Please open up the books, so to say, yeah. and discuss about, uh, about their pains probably but they are not very open normally our clients so but at the end um, there is no easy answer it pays back after a year or seven yeah. so it, the value is what you do with the, with the data what you do with that information in your company to do something better and that drives the return of the investment at the end mm -hmm. and probably it's very normal that we talk about return of investment since years. This counts everything, so to say. But I believe there is a bit of change. We have new rules, uh, new, new um, uh, requirements to fulfill where we have to do. And so we need to do smarter buildings, mm -hmm. not creating buildings as we have did 30 years ago. And this is to be brought into the focus. Mm -hmm. But why is it so difficult? Um, I'm looking at you, gentlemen, and uh, happy uh, you may jump in if you would like to answer this question. So why, why is it so difficult to communicate this and how can we do that better? How can we um, make that easier for, for well, the financial department and others to understand and the management level especially? It's, uh, it's, when I can jump in, it's uh, very difficult to, uh, to convince uh, managers to implement a new technology because the questions they are coming directly back is, what is the return time? But for me, the worst answer I can get from a manager is, I didn't know that, that you could provide us or to offer or this. So that's the worst answer I can get. It means I failed because I have to bring to them new technology. What you think about this? This company can offer this. This company can offer this. What you think about that? Can't you? Can't it be something for you that we can implement in our small building that you can use? You can example. You have examples from there or there or this this supplier or this supplier. So it's for me as real estate uh, responsible for uh, the electricity installations. For me, it's important to, to give the manager the tools that he probably don't know, but he like to know. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my target for the future. Mm -hmm. Give him the right tools. That's a really good point. And also speak their language, maybe right? Like <laughs> uh, they understand what you actually want. Uh, any other suggestions? They only, they only understand one language. That's financial. <laughs> <laughs> that's numbers, black on white. <laughs> well, I think. Uh, if I may, I think this is a key topic, not just talking uh, to managers. This is the interdisciplinary approach that needs to be learned. I mean, these, these technologies are really uh, cross industry. Huh? I mean, already between building technology and IT, there's such a big gap in terms of language and understanding and processes and so on. The, 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 the way how the buildings have been, of today have been built during the last uh, 50 years is a very traditional sectorial approach okay you ha you have a supplier for the hvac system you have a supplier for electricity you have a supplier for it and they have been de dealing independently but nowadays you don't build a house with just a uh, a number of plugs uh, and a, a central heating and that's all if we're talking about smart buildings it's interconnection of, of systems and the value add the most value add comes only through the combination of those different systems. There's of course also value add, simple value add by just adding something uh, relatively obvious of uh, finding uh, the, 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 the microchips uh, you have lost. Yes, of course, there's a, there's a big value in that as well. But really innovative, 
net new value comes often of combining disciplines. And this is not within a company only, but this is also, of course, also between companies. We need no single company can solve it alone. And we need to be able to understand each other better, find common languages and create value add. And in particular, in the building and construction industry, there's a lot of value of uh, coming together at the beginning and not uh, just uh, doing contract management and claims management, but rather finding the best solution for uh, the customer and have a common vision and work together. Uh, I think this is the right approach for the future. But isn't that easier said than done? I mean, we always say that, okay, find the right partners, collaborate together with other companies, but also there a lot of, yeah, sometimes I'd say tension or like it, it might be even difficult to find those right partners, no? Uh, Probably yes. I what I also would like to to add yeah. to Evo would be um, there is also a need in how to do all that. So uh, not it's not only um, document on planning something like a typical engineer and tender it, mm -hmm. go out to market, mm -hmm. search for the that company who could deliver it for the low price at the end. Um, it is more to partner up at the very beginning, well, not at the, at the super very beginning, but even there on, on, on that path, on that track, there is a need to, to build up trust. And also there, these trust building um, is, this is a task of all of us doing it together. Um, um, demonstrating areas like in Aachen uh, from the tec technical universities. This is it, uh, essential mm -hmm. to show that these new technologies work to each other and can interoperate. Yeah. That is super essential. Looking towards the other speakers again. <coughs> Maybe here is also a question, what do you want to do? Do you want really to do the latest, latest technology that you maybe only can find on some startups? Uh, they experiment with that since a year and, and you are not, it's maybe not uh, industry proven or there is often a lot of technology that is maybe already some, some uh, installations, maybe some hundred installations, you know, uh, that will work and this company has some uh, stability and this may be also here uh, or quite sure here in the next few years and that's uh, something also a decision you have to do at the beginning what, which, on which level I want to play with my digitalization project and then also what's the right partner I think often the right partner is also the one that helps me uh, in the overall project so just to deliver technology then yeah we have this technology but how do I uh, achieve my or uh, um, achieve my pro processes with this new technology? How do I take the people with me with this uh, new technology? And I think that's somehow underestimated. We we have a look to the technology and find out okay, there's a lot around this technology to build a successful solution. Yeah, very good point. Okay, then I would like to move to one more topic, which is actually one of the, well, the big topics we've been talking about today. And uh, Ralf mentioned this in his pre presentation. So lighting being like the, the platform for Industry 4.0 for allowing all those um, services and those solutions. I would like to have your opinions on this. Is this something that you, where you say, okay, this is good, I like this, um, or what's your opinion um, on this uh, infrastructure uh, like light? to be part of this who would like to start maybe peter <laughs> i uh, i think it's a, it's great because this is definitely a hurdle what we have to bring up the technology into the world because it's quite complex so if everybody who could help in order to make this process very simple and productized is is, is a hero for me because after that if you bring it more it gets cheaper and useful for me it's always a question you know um uh, there is, you could have so many services afterwards not only logistical think uh, think about retail you know think about um you uh, know if you take about uh, uh, big uh, train stations and so on what additional service you could bring out 
even if there is a technology in place. So by knowing that for, for some areas, if you go deep into a production, maybe it's not precise enough, but then you can put a, an additional sensors, for example, on top. So for me, it would it, it, this is a game changer into the whole game IoT, in my point of view. Mm -hmm. Other opinions? <coughs> yes? Yeah, for me, it's also for us, as Boss said, so when we want to install such a large file management system, so we always have to fight with the IT of the customer to play some access points uh, to communicate uh, with, with our labels or scales. And for me, it's in a way a no brainer. And I, I'm, I'm wondering why it's not already invented and since 20 years, because light you have everywhere. Uh, light you need everywhere where people are working and uh, it's yeah it's really the question why it's not already done since yes <laughs> maybe some trouble <laughs> you, you put it in 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 in, in the back uh, pocket and uh yeah for me it's it, it's so, somehow a no-brainer yeah. yeah maybe yeah, you waited a... till that perfect moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yes indeed yeah we would love to have it done 20 years ago <laughs> definitely uh, i think that is exactly the part where where the market comes what is the market requiring yeah. from us um, as delivering something sometimes you can come up with there is something new that fits exactly to this and that what we've done with lighting controls dimmable luminaires something like that that helps a lot or helped a lot in the past um, i would say with the whole discussion of digitalization and all these sensors and smart buildings what came up i would say really to a bigger market since two years three years with a pandemic a lot of uh, speed has come in mm, okay. however um, I completely agree uh, why not earlier it would it would be perfect yes it is and with our tecton trunking system as an example a simple example we are able today to use these for providing providing data to easily and super flexible install luminaires or sensors at uh, at places without changing something in the installation mm -hmm. in the electrical installation that is given today that is probably the reason why this product is quite successful <laughs> maybe that is yeah. well uh, Rudy I mean you've uh, you've implemented this so uh, how happy are you <laughs> I'm, I'm very happy with this uh, the struggle we only have to fight is with the IT guys uh, <laughs> it's the same problems I'm facing uh, at Volvo as you know for example to uh, implement a server in a separate network it cost me a year fighting with IT yeah. Of course, they have their reasons, but if you have such an amount of data, it's uh, the target must be that it can be handled easily by programs, by software that can easily help us without thinking and just screening something that we can use directly. That's the, mm. that's the target uh, we have to go. Is one of because the, other, sorry, go on. Sorry. Otherwise, you need something, you need, you need uh, somebody to evaluate the data who is coming. You must be have an automatic program that's doing this for you. It's also one of the challenging topics that you have with your IT guys about cybersecurity, or is that not correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and protect. Yeah, protect this data. Yeah, it's one of the topics that Ivo uh, actually also mentioned in his presentation. I guess this is a, this is a big topic yep. at the moment for every company in every aspect. And uh, watching all those presentations, I was thinking actually quite a lot about this, about uh, yep. IoT, industrial IoT security. Um, what, what are like the challenges that your clients come to? Um, yeah, maybe Ralf, you can start. What what kind of challenges do they have there, or how can you solve them as well? <laughs> oh, well really, solving we as an as a, 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 yeah. a technology supplier, the lighting supplier, I don't think that we can do this. But what we could do, we could um, offer to use the standards of the market. Mm -hmm. Also in cybersecurity, there are standards more or less out. What is very typical in in usage? Sure, we should not use a very proprietary uh, communication protocol what only we can uh, what makes us probably not that easy to hack mm. or to understand but at the end it doesn't help so we need some standards and we have to 
take care that we do the best of yeah cloud protecting i would say but and at the end um, most of it departments believe or think they have the best security mm. for their system mm. but i i doubt a bit there i i think one of the high level security is on cloud systems mm -hmm. where you use standard standardization from the big providers oh Ivo, what do you recommend to your clients when they come to you with with those challenges of cyber security <coughs> Well, I think the well, there's two different cases. The one case number one, still the most frequent one, is people are not aware at all what are their risks. Uh, and for manufacturing production, there there are big risks. And the second ones are those that have been hit by a cyber attack or a suspected uh, cyber attack, and they ru rush and say, oh, "Oh, we have to change everything, and uh, please tell me what to do." And it's not so easy because the, the existing systems. Uh, are really not uh, very secure as many successful cyber attacks uh, show show today. So uh, first is really the understanding what what you can do, and then the second thing is really and and we have now a little bit been talking about oh, those IT guys that don't uh, understand the requirements from business. Uh, I would just like to highlight that in the IT standardization and frameworks a lot of these security topics have been addressed and in all the other technology systems uh, developed by, by large players and by small players there's still lots of proprietary approaches that are really not very well done i'm personally convinced that the computational power so the handling of data and the manipulation and management of data will all move to the cloud and the only thing is to, we have to make sure how this gets securely to the cloud. But actually, the IIoT is uh, having the, real, the right um, mechanisms and regulations and standards how to solve this. The problem is just the transition from where we are today to there. This is really complex. This is really not easy. This is not the shortcut uh, approach, uh, but uh, we can deal with uh, those topics. We can identify the most uh, exposed uh, threat points for companies. We can uh, address how to deal it, uh, with them, but there is not a single answer. The only thing you cannot do is just ignore and hope that it goes uh, beyond you, because uh, this is, uh, this is uh, the, the work that what, what you just mentioned before, the uh, security by obscurity, by just creating some proprietary thing nobody understands, is working maybe for a couple of years, but uh, after that you will be forced to something more open and then uh, you're in trouble. Because otherwise it's dangerous, yeah. yes. <laughs> How is that with the last mile management, uh, Urs? Is that also uh, a risk for cyber attacks? Yes, <clears throat> they are, of course, uh, but uh, luckily, we work with the technology of SSD Marco Tag, and they are used in retail. So there you have hundreds or thousands of people that try to go in to manipulate prices of the goods and so on. So they, they, so we have here some, some experienced technology and uh, we think uh, we are safe. As, as everyone thinks, <laughs> uh, we are safe and uh, it's, it's really an, um, an um, yeah, that you start really from beginning on, if you have your data in the cloud, they are maybe quite um, quite safe there, but also the way to the cloud is, is, is important that you secure this and then make sure no one can manipulate the data, bring in some other data or steal some data. Okay, let me just uh, remind our audience, this is the last chance for you to ask any questions. So if you do have any, then please post them into the chat. And then I think uh, I would like to do a quick last round, um, talking about some trends and having a look uh, into the future of logistics and digitalization. Um, do you see any trends or is there, what is your next project? What are you really looking at at the moment? Uh, I would like to start with, with Rudy. What's, uh, what's next on your journey now? Oh, my next uh, direct journey next year is uh, to uh, to give the management the data they they want, and that especially is the the consumption data. That's the first thing I, I will I will start, and the next uh, will the opportunities I see now uh, with this uh, meeting that we have uh, to give them the information and uh, look what they do with it. Okay, very good. 
Peter, what about you? What what kind of trends do you see? And what is your next next thing on your list? Yeah, we have a close cooperation to a company which is serving cross docking warehouses. And what we are now have done, we have equipped all these warehouses run about 80 with already the sensors. And now we're putting more and more additional services on an app for these customers. For example, find very important assets in, in a good way. You know, find it that they are secure and so on. So that means put using the existing infrastructure to make more and more effort and, 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 and productivity out of that. This is what I'm looking after, especially in the logistics. Mm -hmm. Very good. Urs, what about you? So, uh, yeah, we are, we're working on our smart factory logistics systems to enlarge them, but one focus will be also here to make it more easy and understandable for the people. So at the end, we, will, we, we say, okay, we want to have our uh, ARIMS mobile app. They should be so easy as you go to Instagram and uh, as you are used in your uh, consumer uh, business uh, today. So it should be at the end that also the 60-year-old guy uh, can manipulate with our uh, solutions here or everyone who thinks uh, it's, it's not my first uh, job to do the... The, the digital work so that it is, yeah, it's really uh, bring it to the people, make it touchable, make it understandable and make it somehow uh, self-explaining. Mm -hmm. That's a really nice next uh, target. I really like that to make it really easy. Ivo, when you look at your clients, what, what kind of trends do you see? What is important uh, to them now this year and then the next? Well, uh, of course, uh, we all know that uh, the pandemic has been a huge driver to many digitalization practices and efforts. Uh, now we need to turn back again also to the climate crisis. And uh, also this will have a huge impact uh, in terms of sustainability topics. Many of those sustainability topics can only be addressed with digitization, especially if we look at all the construction material uh, side, there's huge potential for digitization. But a little bit closer back to logistics, I think I think uh, one of the most uh, burning issues is that really if you start new uh, facility construction projects, please start with those digitalization topics at a very early stage and don't start with building first uh, a big hull there and then uh, start to uh, put in some production lines and then start to think about what do I need in terms of uh, infrastructure for realizing my digitalization uh, use cases. This is something that is unfortunately still not addressed in many uh, early uh, concepts for new buildings and this needs to be changed and this is something we're working on with our clients. Uh, right away. I think this is uh, some really good advice and some advice that you would share as well, right? Definitely, <laughs> yes, absolutely. I would advise that too. Yeah, right. What um, else? What is the? What is that? What you see? Uh, what kind of trends and what's your? What's your next target? What would you uh, like? Def to definitely, what I what I do see is a lot of uh, inquiries to to us to us consultants um, on um, digital ideas. Asset tracking as an, as an uh, example is really everybody talks in the moment from that. Mm -hmm. However, at the end, what I will do, I still going on talking to the market together with our partners. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I would say helping Rudy on that energy consumption topic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, very good. Thank <laughs> Rudy, you. Rudy likes that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's very very good. <laughs> very good. Well, uh, gentlemen, it's been a pleasure to have this panel discussion with you. I would like to say thank you very much. Thank you, Anja. Thank you, Ralf. Thank you um, to all of you here being on a remote connection with us. And also thanks to our participants for listening here today. Um, as I said already, as I mentioned, the platform will be open for another week. So if you say, OK, I want to rewatch this all uh, <laughs> quietly, maybe at night <laughs> or whenever you would like that, uh, you can do that. It's open for one more week. You can also arrange meetings with other participants and obviously check out the fair where you can watch all the videos and have a look at all those brochures from our partners. Because we heard it's important to connect with partners and this is the perfect platform to do so. 
Also, we are very happy if you would like to share some feedback with us. So this is important so that we get better and our uh, events get even better for you to your needs. So please fill in the feedback form. It literally takes two minutes, not even. I did it, one. <laughs> Didn't send it, obviously. Just had a look for you. So please do that, click on the button. And, uh, and of course, thank you. Have some good uh, conversations uh, later on with other partners, with um, other participants, and have a great day. Thank you. See you soon. Bye.